So thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, my name is Dan Khan. I'm the Global Open Finance Lead at Plaid, work on our policy team. I've been at Plaid since 2016 and I joined from Capital One. Um, excited to be here today to talk about solving for security in the ecosystem with Kyle. Kyle, do you want to introduce yourself? Everyone, I'm Kyle. I lead security engineering at Plaid. Security engineering is responsible for uh, product security, data security, abuse, and in our internal security platforms. I've been at Plaid for just about two years now. Um, and before that, I was at Instagram leading their user security and safety team. Awesome. So getting into the agenda for today, uh, we're going to do this quick intros, um, talk about the role of security and open finance and kind of what is open finance in Plaid's world. Um, then Kyle's going to run us through how Plaid enables security. This is going to be a technical perspective, so really useful for developers, folks more on the technical side. Um, but hopefully at a level accessible for just about anybody uh, who works with data. And then we'll wrap up and have a discussion. As Kyle mentioned, uh, we do have the Q&A enabled. So if you have questions, feel free to add them in the sidebar chat. Um, we'll try to address them uh, as they come up. Uh, but if we don't address them while, while the session is going on, we'll address them at the end. So Plaid's perspective on the role of security in enabling open finance and responsible innovation. Before we dive into this, it's worth talking about what open finance is. So open finance is consumer permission data. And consumer permission data has existed for a lot longer than Plaid, um, for a lot longer than open banking, which is kind of a similar term that we often hear about with regards to regulation in markets like the United Kingdom or the European Union. But Basically, it's the concept of consumers sharing their data in order to get a better product and service. In the old paper-based world, you could think of somebody who's a Chase customer and they receive a blue Chase statement in the mail every month. They wanna get a mortgage from Wells Fargo. They walk into Wells Fargo. It has a nice red awning. Um, they want to get approved for the mortgage. The mortgage officer asks, do you have enough money to make a down payment? They say, yes. How do you prove that? You share your blue chase statement. They make a photocopy, put it in the back, put it in a filing cabinet. Um, a lot of what's happening in the digital world is really just replacing those paper-based processes. There's more to it than that, but that's like a very simple way to think about it. Um, so going to the next slide, how Plaid thinks about trust in the ecosystem. Um, this is something that's incredibly important to everybody who works at Plaid. Um, when we think about our core product principles and how do we actually like build the APIs um, that all of our developers use, we start with the consumer mindset. So we need to solve a problem for end users. Those end users can be consumers or small businesses, um, but they're people who have financial data, uh, want to get a better product and service. And so the solutions we're building ultimately should benefit those end users. Um, but in order to make that happen, we also need to serve developers who are the folks who actually pay Plaid money. They're the people who build the software experiences. Um, they're really pushing the edge of innovation in terms of what's happening in the market and driving change. Um, that's the place where we've seen the most adoption over the last few years. Um, but there are a ton of interesting concepts that are still coming out and are new in 2021 and in the coming years. And we're excited to support all of those use cases. And then finally, we need to think about how what we're building interacts with financial institutions who really want to ensure that their customers can connect their accounts safely. Um, this is a third constituent in the ecosystem. And without the financial institutions, which are sometimes called providers uh, of the data, none of this will really work well. So if we go to the next slide, security is what enables trust in this ecosystem. Um, but there are very different perspectives depending on where you sit and what you're trying to achieve. So for consumers, they want access first and foremost. Um, they're not really thinking about security as a top level concern. They do want to avoid becoming victims of fraud, but generally they want an efficient product and service. Um, Plaid developers really care about user experience and conversion. Generally, when you're building something for the first time, it has to be better than what exists in the market. We know that's why the user experience and conversion are key metrics, um, but they're also monitoring for potential abuse of which Kyle's going to go into more detail. And then finally, financial institution partners, they care from a different perspective about protecting their customer uh, and the data 
that is associated with that customer, um, having transparency around where it's flowing, and then preventing fraud. But the common factor for all of this is security. So if we go to the next slide, as we think about enabling responsible innovation, the security risks really do vary based on the scope of customer act activity. And you know, there's shared security risks and then unique security risks that are presented to each actor. Um, but if we think very high level, uh, there are different use cases enabled by Plaid and those actually have different profiles. So if I just think about data movement versus money movement, um, those have different risks associated with them because one has the money is actually flowing somewhere out of your account or into your account and the other it's purely data. So some common examples kind of from least risky to most risky in some sense, although the lines are constantly getting blurred as customers uh, build more and more of these use cases into single apps. But personal financial management, there's no money movement, only data is flowing, it's relatively low risk. Stock trading apps, so this is folks like Robinhood, Webull, uh, Public, uh, places where you can invest in publicly traded securities. Um, there is some risk, there's money movement, you're purchasing stock, but it's custodial stock. And generally at the end of the day, if there was any type of fraud, uh, the holder of the custodial stock, which is generally the company that's building the product or service, could reverse that charge, sell in the market. Uh, they have a liquid security to back up any, any transaction that takes place. And then as we move down the stack, person-to-person -person transfers, folks like Venmo, Square, TransferWise, and a lot of the international money movement, they're seeing both sides of the network. And so while there is risk associated with that money movement, they have a lot more data points um, than even Plaid does around you know, who these users are, what the purpose is, what their history of using the services um, that they can use to help underwrite that risk. And then finally, crypto is one that I always think is interesting because the product that's being sold is actually digital cash. And if you do a bad job with risk management in this use case, you're shit out of luck because that crypto, once it's offsite, um, it can be moved anywhere in the world instantly, and there's really no recourse for that. So, you know, Plaid developers, the people who are building these products and services, think about risk very differently. The same is true of the providers. Um, so emerging fintechs, for the most part, they actually want their customers to have access to the financial ecosystem, to be able to use products like Venmo and Square Cash and Robinhood that are really popular and their customers are demanding or send money internationally with transfer wise, um, but they don't have that many end users um, and they're generally not targeted um, for attacks. Whereas when we move up the stack past the community, regional banks, credit unions to the large national multinational banks, they're constantly seeing all kinds of malicious activity taking place that's targeting them and their end users just because they have the most accounts. Um, and so, the point of this slide is really to say that risk enforcement has to be calibrated for the profile of the activity that's taking place. And that applies to Plaid, it applies to the developer applications, and it applies to the financial institutions that we work with. Um, so there's no one size fits all approach, um, but we do have to take into account uh, risk when we're interacting with all of these players. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kyle to talk uh, in a little more detail about the technical side of things. Uh, cool. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan, uh, for kind of giving an overview of how uh, trust and security are crucial to kind of ensuring that the Plaid ecosystem uh, continues to grow and that all of us are uh, continuing to be successful in this ecosystem. Um, so Dan talked a lot about who are like the stakeholders in this ecosystem. It's Plaid, it's everyone here today, and it's the financial institutions that power uh, all the data behind everything as well. Um, it is important. There's kind of a, a big list of different verticals and industries Plaid supports. There are very big and different risk profiles associated with those verticals, but I did want to kind of dig into like two very specific uh, risks that Plaid thinks a lot about. Um, everyone here is going to think a lot about, regardless of if you're in crypto or personal finance management. Um, these are common risks that, that we're all going to experience. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through two, two risks, uh, some of the things Plaid does to mitigate those risks or at least reduce those risks, and some of the things we can all do here 
uh, as well. Whether you know we're one person at we're like a one person startup for part of like a hundred person company, uh, these things will apply to all of us. And um, some some ideas on how to uh, mitigate these risks. Um, there is a big list of risks, um, but I think there's two that are pretty fundamental to this ecosystem. Um, you know, whether your product's being used for financial transactions, which does give attackers an opportunity to, to uh, exploit your product for monetary gain. Um, there's also a lot of our products that are based around storing sensitive data. Uh, there's also a lot of value for attackers to get that data, even if it's not directly being uh, abusing your product. Um, so the two risks I'm talking, I'm going to talk about. The first risk is product abuse. This is bad users using like the legitimate parts of your product in ways it was not intended. The first place that product abuse comes up is during your onboarding or during user registrations and signups. This is your front door. So this is basically when you get the most information about your users up front, and we can really start making those risk-based assessments on what you'll allow this user to do in your product. Um, and the second part of product abuse is once they're inside that front door, uh, how do you prevent them from abusing your product once they're using it, once they're going through the common use cases uh, in your app or your product. The second risk I'm going to talk about is risk around data security and data security incidents. Uh, so, product, so product abuse is people using your product, uh, using kind of endpoints and flows that it's intended to do, but just in ways that are malicious. Uh, data security is kind of uh, when attackers are looking for ways to exfiltrate data from your app, your API, your platform, um, because they find that data itself has monetary value. That could be you know, user information, contact information, transaction histories, um, all, all sorts of things like that. Um, and when I talk about data security, uh, the data is not just about the data you're storing about your users, um, but things like your code. Your code base could be sensitive. There could be secrets um, that are important to your business inside of that. Um, you might have uh, you know, an ML model that's you know, providing uh, loan origination or something that's really unique. That could be really sensitive data as well that's at risk. So starting with onboarding, right? That's kind of the first, uh, first step any user uh, will uh, have with you and your, and your product. Um, so managing risk during customer onboarding, customer signup is absolutely crucial uh, for maintaining the larger uh, trust in the ecosystem. Um, and so the first thing that we always like to say, and we, we, we try to do at Plaid, we try to ensure our customers, uh, sorry, our developers are doing it as well. The more information you can get about a user during onboarding, the better of a judgment call you can make on the risk profile of this user. Um, we have a lot of uh, really uh, high growth startups probably in this crowd. We understand that there, you know, there is a balance between how much information you're allowed to collect or you want to collect um, and how easy you want it to be to onboard your customers. So we do understand it's a very fine line, um, but the more information you can get during onboarding, the more real you can, hopefully, I say hopefully, the more, real, the, the more uh, information you can really use to verify that customer's or that user's identity. Um, and so, you know, it could be contact points, you know, personal information, ways to verify that the user's saying who they are. Um, so that's kind of like one step one to do that. Uh, a second way is regardless of information provided by users, um, something Plaid does and something there's a lot of uh, tools and open source uh, frameworks to do this is try to get uh, information around where your users are coming from when they access your, your app or your product. Um, and so one of the things we like to do at Plaid, uh, you know, if a user is uh, connecting a bank account and they're in New York City and the bank's located in New York, that's probably going to be a legitimate user. That all kind of lines up. Um, if you see a user, you know, on a VPN connecting through somewhere in Europe and they're adding like a, a credit union in Montana, that's going to look really different. That's not going to look like probably what a normal user would do. Um, and so something we do is we try to, we try to fingerprint, fingerprint uh, traffic that comes through Plaid Link and identify uh, sources of good and bad traffic. Um, and there's a tool, for example, uh, you can Google this after the session or during the session. Um, Salesforce came out with a tool called JA3. And essentially, you can put it into your onboarding flow. Um, it has like a known list of parameters to look at network traffic. It can kind of tell you if this is likely someone coming from Chrome. This is usually what a good Chrome user looks like versus uh, this is someone running like a iOS emulator in a data center somewhere else in like Asia, right? Very kind of uh, unique traffic patterns. Um, so that's something that, that we do a lot of. We encourage our customers as well to understand what good traffic and bad traffic looks like on their product um, and, and take risk uh, 
judgments based on that. Um, another thing that's really important and that's really useful during your onboarding and your signup flows, um, integrating third-party intelligence. Um, and so uh, depending on your app, you might get you know, contact information. Uh, there's a lot of third-party services that can help verify that contact information. Um, something Plaid, Plaid likes to do a lot is, you know, if we have uh, potential usernames or contact points, in theory, we could connect that to a third-party data source of credentials that we suspect may have been compromised. Um, I mentioned HIB, HIBP here. Uh, there's a service called Have I Been Pwned? Um, essentially, if, if you have a user onboarding to your app and they give you an email address, you can actually go and check if this email address has been in a, in a data breach uh, in the last you know, four or five years, right? You might do something different to that user during that onboarding flow based on that information. Um, and there's, there's a wide range of other signals, or not just for uh, compromise, um, you know, you can get sources that tell you if uh, if an IP address is on like a phone um, or like a, you know, a residential IP. Um, there's services that'll take a phone number um, and verify if it's like a, you know, a residential phone number, a business phone number, a cell phone number. It can tell you if that cell phone number has been uh, changed really recently. These are all really helpful signals to ensure that the users that are onboarding to your application are who they say they are or at least have like good credentials, whether, yeah, it's a contact point or the information they provide. In addition to that, kind of something that's always important too, this is one of like the most important uh, things we recommend. Plaid does it, we, we really uh, recommend it to our developers, add additional forms of authentication to your application. So traditionally you've had a username or an email address is kind of like a login, uh, login token or whatever, username um, and a password. Uh, just, you know, with the scale of data breaches and the ease of the easiness it is to get kind of access to credentials that may have been compromised, adding a second layer of authentication is, is super important. Um, one of the common attacks we see at Plaid um, and we see around the ecosystem is uh, attackers basically taking like a big database of just suspected uh, credentials. It could be like a username and password and just running it across kind of the internet, right? Looking for uh, fintech apps, using that data and seeing if any of those accounts are valid. So with a second form of authentication, that attack is basically mitigated um, because most, most of these kind of data breaches, you'll have you know, one or two pieces of contact information, but you won't have like, for example, the you know, access to the SMS number connected with that with multi-factor authentication um, or using kind of more uh, newer and advanced forms of multi-factor authentication, the user will need a physical device that an attacker like that who's just running kind of uh, a, a database dump of credentials won't have access to. Um, there's a couple uh, things you can use to support multi-factor authentication. Um, we've seen a lot of customers use, if you use AWS, Amazon Web Services, they have a, 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 a service called Cognito. It basically handles authentication for you. That includes signups, password management. You can add multi-factor authentication. It handles all the SMS. It could be email codes. Um, I think it actually supports physical devices as well. If you want to use like a touch key, um, stuff like that is super cool. You know, it, it could get kind of dicey to roll your own authentication. Maybe you're a small team, right? That's really great stuff to hand off to someone who just does it as a service. Um, there's other there's other applications out there called, um, another example is Stitch. Stitch is offering uh, other additional ways to verify user's identity. Um, it could be like through phone notifications um, and even like, a, hand touch, uh, sorry, uh, finger touch uh, authentication as well. Um, so there's a lot of options there for uh, even smaller companies to get all the benefits of um, all these third signal detections as well as multi-factor authentication. Uh, I just kind of have an example here too. Uh, Plaid, we are big believers in multi-factor authentication. We actually will add multi-factor authentication on top of uh, our link experience when it's possible. If um, you know, not every banking uh, platform supports it directly, but we'll always try to add it and force it on top of it uh, if available as well. That's how important we think it is to the ecosystem. So now your customer's onboarded, right? Cool. They're inside your application. They're using your API. You know, we're not, it's not free and clear yet, right? So now that they're in your application, that's really when the abuse, you know, looking for uh, data, looking for sensitive data, that's when the abuse can really start. Um, and the first thing we always recommend, and as, as the abuse team at Plaid, we work a lot with new products at Plaid uh, to think about such sensible limits. Um, and that's again, kind of like if um, 
you know, customer onboarding, uh, multi-factor is probably one of the most important parts for product abuse. Sensible limits is probably like our first go-to thing we'll recommend for new products at Plaid. Um, and like, you know, when you think about sensible limits, it's like, hey, what happens if someone uses my, uh, you know, money transfer endpoint 10,000 times in a minute? that's probably going to be a really high risk situation for your application. But on the flip side of that is, you know, that onboarding flow, right? What if I'm able to make a thousand accounts? Maybe I'm not collecting enough data. Maybe I'm not verifying enough data up front. A thousand accounts doing the same thing once or twice is just as bad. And so when I say, say some sensible limits, it's not always just about, hey, someone's going to brute force my app. Uh, what happens if someone's able to create a lot of accounts or onboard a lot of fake users to my account and do actions as well? Uh, second, is uh, enabling friction inside your applications. And so when I think about friction, it's like ways to slow down uh, attackers or even ways to slow down real users who might be increasing the risk of your application. And so when I say friction, uh, a good example is um, during onboarding. Maybe someone is onboarding to your application. Um, you have one of those network signals I talked about in the last slide. It says this user is coming in from uh, you know, a VPN somewhere that's far from where they're suspected to be. Maybe you add something like a capture, right? They have to kind of, you know, uh, type out the letters in an image, right? That adds some frictions, that slows them down. That's harder for an attacker to automate. Um, friction could be a, a wide variety of things. You know, captures are kind of the common thing. You know, you know, you have to like pick a picture, uh, solve a math equation. Um, but it can, it can even be something like asking the user to re-authenticate. Um, you know, maybe someone was on a shared computer. Someone like happened to load up a tab in your app. And now they're gonna, you know, oh, someone's logged in. I'm gonna go maybe, you know, take some money out of their account. Um, forcing a user to reauthenticate proves that they're still the user that you think they are uh, when they're doing that action. And lastly, one of the things that's most important: the more sensitive or the more risk uh, an action or like a flow in your product is, uh, the the further kind of embedded into that application or your or your product, uh, the better, right? And so a common use case that kind of shows like the, the examples of when this goes wrong um, is, you know, uh, we've, seen a, we've seen customers in the past who might've put Plaid link, right? That's connecting a bank account. That's a lot of sensitive data associated with that, putting that really early in their onboarding flow. Um, and so, you know, talking about one of those attacks we see regularly where someone takes a, a set of compromised credentials, runs it across the internet, um, you know, embedding Plaid link, like really early in your onboarding flow, Maybe they don't even need to verify an account on your application. Cool, now they found a, uh, an app that can be used to kind of uh, attack Plaid and again, reduce the trust in our ecosystem as well. Um, right, so the example I gave here is don't, in Plaid, don't embed Plaid for authentication, right? The more due diligence you can do on your customers, uh, the more you can trust them, the more you can trust them to do sensitive actions like connecting their bank account, doing money transfer, uh, stuff like that. Um, and the, the deeper sensitive or risky actions are in your platform and your application, as you do get more advanced and you are able to better track user behavior, um, you're able to then kind of see what real users do to get to that place, right? Um, you know, putting a sensitive action really easy to get to in your application, you know, look really different from, you know, a real user clicking through a couple buttons, you know, getting some data, taking that money transfer action, for example, versus an attacker who just logs into your app, goes right to that page, knows like knows all the information they need to submit and does that transaction, right? And those will look very different when you have a lot more information to kind of follow the user through your application or your platform. Um, cool, I just wanna, I don't know if this, this slide, is, you can see it all. Um, I just kind of wanna show like what, what a lot of this looks like in kind of a larger company who's had some time to build out uh, abuse detection. And oftentimes what happens is um, you'll come up with kind of an abuse platform that can then be powering new products, right? And so uh, something Plaid has, for example, we have a system called Escalate. It's kind of like a centralized rule processing engine. New products can send it events. And then both the abuse team, our risk team, and the product owners can add rules on top of that to prevent abuse. Um, and those rules can be looking for, you know, 10 users taking 100 actions. They can be looking for things like, uh, this user is not coming from a place we think this action be taken from, um, and it really just makes it accessible for, for a wide variety of people concerned with risk to protect their products. Um, so, you know, putting that all together, this is kind of like what a, a modern uh, abuse infrastructure system would look like at a company like Plaid.
Cool. Now that I've talked about abuse, right? Abuse is really focused on going through your product, doing stuff that real users would do, but doing it in malicious ways. The second risk I want to talk about is risks around data security, right? And so your product, there's a lot of, there could be a lot of risks associated with it, right? You could be moving crypto, you know, uh, funding accounts, doing loans, all kind of high value transactions. Um, but the data under that, the data powering all of that, the data you're storing around your users, uh, consumers of your products, that data is going to be very valuable as well. I'm assuming we're all mostly in fintech here. That's actually really valuable data to attackers. And so now that we've kind of talked about protecting your products, how do you protect the data powering that product? Um, and I'll probably kind of think about data in like a three, three phase life cycle. There's data at rest. You're storing that data. Transit, how does that data move around? And that means both internally, maybe you have a couple of different systems that process data uh, inside of your, your company and how the data is transferred to customers as well. And the last, the last phase is kind of data retention. Uh, data retention, we think about that as things like data deletion, you know, retention policies around your data. That's kind of the last phase uh, we think about for data security. Um, and so kind of doing a quick overview, like some things to do around each of those phases of data to reduce the risks associated with that data. The first one, data at rest. Um, the more you can abstract away and just make, you know, storing sensitive data at your company magical, uh, the, the better, uh, the less risk you have associated with managing that data. Um, and so I talk about abstracting away data security functions. Um, that's a model, that's a model Plaid uses. That's a model we really recommend uh, customers and developers and everyone here to use. Um, when I say security, data security functions, it's like data encryption, right? I'm going to store uh, maybe a user's uh, bank account and routing number. I, I, I'm hopefully storing that encrypted. Um, you know, if I'm an engineer, uh, the less I have to worry about how do I get encryption keys, how do I decrypt this, uh, the better. And so one of the things we really uh, recommend for people is finding ways to make kind of data management um, really easy to use for people building products. And that's really great because one, you know, the risk is kind of uh, taken off of you know, everyone and, you know, there's like a good team that can handle that risk. And also that ensures that new product development can continue really quickly, right? The, the, the you know, user experience around building products and handling data um, really becomes de-risked when you think about centralizing kind of how data is managed um, and de-risked that way. Data in transit, uh, making sure that uh, if you have like a couple uh, services internally that handle data, you know, maybe you have like an API gateway that's where users connect to, and that's connect, connecting to maybe like a user data service internally. Make sure those services are sending data uh, securely between each other's between between each other. That could be using SSL, TLS, uh, HTTPS. Um, you know, some people use gRPC, right? There's a lot of ways to secure those and make sure that if someone was inside of your application or they're inside of like your AWS uh, account, you know, going between your your servers there, uh, they can't see or, or understand the traffic that's happening and being sent between services. Um, and then uh, the last point here too, yeah, I think I talked about this earlier, but when I talk about data security, uh, you know, data is your user data, your product data, it's your source code. Um, you know, it's, you know, training data for your ML models. If you have that, um, it could be storing, you know, you, like user documents, right? Maybe you've collected some, some diligence for a user. They've uploaded PDFs. You're storing those in S3, um, all of that can be sensitive data, right? And so these rules kind of apply not just to, you know, your database, um, but, but basically anything that you're storing that could be uh, risk or provide risk or be a value to an attacker. Um, there's, a, there's a headline here I put in, uh, and right, when I talk about data security, right, this was, uh, there was an attack last year um, on an analytics company called Waydev. And so Waydev essentially was a way, uh, you would hook it up to, uh, if you use like a source code manager, you could hook it up to that. Um, and it would tell you kind of, you know, how productive are engineers, when are people writing code, you know, if there's any like places that are bottlenecks, uh, it provided kind of value to companies that way. Um, but to do that, it needed access to your source code. And actually last year there was a breach, Waydev had a breach, um, someone got access to Waydev, and then it had access to a wide variety of companies' source code because of, of where it sat kind of in the ecosystem there. Um, and so I think this is a good example where, you know, you think about your data, you know, what's, what's looking at your source code right now, right? You know, what's looking at your HR data, right? That's all really important data um, that maybe, you know, external vendors, external services, uh, external employees have access to. 
Um, cool. So kind of digging into a little bit more uh, examples of how you can protect your data. Uh, data at rest. Um, there's a lot of great systems, especially I'm talking about AWS. I just I know a lot of people use AWS, but similar uh, cloud platforms, Google Cloud Platform has these features as well. Uh, there's a lot of services that can kind of handle data encryption. It can manage the keys you use to do that data encryption. Uh, Amazon KMS is great. It'll rotate keys uh, annually for you automatically. It's like a setting you can enable. Um, so that's one of the most common things a lot of uh, auditors are looking for, right? Do you have key management? Can you rotate those keys? Um, you know, don't, you don't have to write that, right? Like we're all, we're all trying to move fast. Um, there's a lot of great ways to do it that are accessible in kind of many of the common platforms we're using. Um, there's even really cool vendors in this space. One's called Evervault. And basically they, they call themselves a data vault, right? Um, you know, you basically send them data and, you know, they handle encryption, you know, they'll return tokenized data, depending on who you're asking that data for, uh, it can rotate keys, basically it just like it's an entire kind of data security team um, via API that you can just host internally, it's super cool. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do this, you know, if you do have some time, you do have the resources, maybe your data is extra sensitive. Um, there's a lot of really white, lightweight days, sorry, lightweight ways to basically, you know, we kind of call it like a data black box, right? Like I just want some data that black box handles again, encryption, decryption, who's acting for the data, what kind of data can I return? Um, there's a company called Gusto, they're a payroll, uh, they're like an HR uh, data aggregator. Um, they wrote a blog post on this tool called Happy, H-A-P-I-I, -I, if you Google it. Um, it's kind of like a really great overview about how you can write some of this stuff internally if you do want to, uh, you know, maybe you don't want to send data to a vendor like Evervault, it is still pretty easy to spin up some of these services that, that really de-risk sensitive data internally at your company. And the last part, uh, data retention, um, a couple key things here that, that Plaid does. And again, these are more like really just like high level tips that I think everyone should be able to do here. Um, you know, one of the things we, we encourage at Plaid, um, make sure people who are, who are writing data, who are writing your products, can kind of annotate and tag the data they're using, right? The more context you have around data inside of your app, your platform, uh, the, the smarter choices you can make about where that data is going, how you're storing that data, how that data is being deleted, kind of the whole process around that data. Um, second, a data map is always crucial. Um, you know, the longer you, you do a data map, the longer you wait to do data map, the harder it does kind of become to, ha become to have. And so the earlier you can kind of start to annotate that data. When I say data map, it's like, okay, this database stores this, you know, username, phone number, this database, it might just store some IDs, you know, not as risky. And then understanding, you know, what services talk to which, right? And so, you know, maybe there's one service that's just all sensitive data, talking to a lot of services that are considered less risky, but it's sending that sensitive data there to you. Uh, a data map can help you identify those kind of gaps and like the risks around data internally. Um, and the last thing is, is just, you know, ensuring that you're checking in and regularly auditing who has access to your data. So in the previous slide, I talked about kind of that case where, um, you know, a source code a productivity provider was breached. Uh, you know, a lot of people had issues once that, once that breach happened uh, because they weren't even using that, that company WayDev anymore. They just had not deep provisioned kind of the access keys to that. They didn't regularly audit that um, and they became uh, at risk during that breach. Um, so always taking a step back and understanding who has access to my data, where's my data going um, is, is super crucial here as well. Cool. Cool. I'll just take it from Thanks, there. Kyle. That was a lot. And uh, that last topic's really important. We're going to cover one more thing and then we'll get to the questions. I saw a couple of people entering questions into the Q&A, but you know, something we're developing this year and we've been talking to a few of our customers and bank partners, regulators about, um, but you'll hear more about this in 2022, is our open finance data. Um, this is something we've been working with security firms, um, with some of our direct competitors who are other data aggregators, FI partners and customers, um, as you know, something that can help uh, small teams, uh, fast growing teams. I like to call it two gals in a garage. Maybe they just graduated from Y Combinator. They're building a FinTech app. What should they be doing versus a company that has hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of users and really write some of those rules of the road. So take some of the best practices Kyle's talking about, make them really easy to implement, really easy to audit. Um, that's the goal of this project. Um, it's a security framework that's optimized for the world that we live in, in 2021, 2022, where most folks are building on a cloud platform 
like an AWS, a Google Cloud, or a Microsoft. Um, it, we're not going to ask the same types of questions as PCI DSS about like, do you have locks on your server cabinets? Because it's just not as relevant to the way that people are building today. Um, the goal of this is to be fairly um, light touch, uh, but also to give folks tools that actually can help level up the actual security in the ecosystem and not just be uh, another check the box um, audit or th something that you have to go through there. So this is something we welcome feedback on. Um, we put a contact email here, OFDSS at plaid.com. Um, if you are interested in the topic uh, today, and especially Kyle's presentation, we'd love to talk more uh, to you about this uh, as we're developing um, these products. And with that, we'll turn it over to questions. Um, Kyle, I can take the first one, and then maybe you can talk about the second one about uh, embedding Plaid prior to authentication, um, although I do have some ancient history there. Uh, so is Plaid currently requiring MFA across the board when not required by FIs, or is this a future feature? Will there be a data indicator for when this happens and will it be configurable by clients? So it's not 100% required just because we always are thinking about how to trade off access, um, meaning you know people who bank potentially at these institutions that haven't necessarily updated um, their security posture. Um, and giving them access and giving folks who bank at the large institutions or the fintechs access who tend to have MFA built in natively uh, to their authentication. So as Kyle mentioned, we do have a step up MFA feature and we try to enable that in as many places as possible um, when it's not enabled natively by the bank. It's not 100%, but it's a very high percentage. Um, and will there be a data indicator for when this happens? Will it be configurable by clients? Um, that's something that we can take away, uh, Farhad, and get back to you. I think in our documentation, you can see some of this already, um, but we can check if there's uh, additional features there. I can take this question. So is it possible to embed Plaid before authentication? So, so yes, it is possible to do that. And kind of a common use case we'll see in, in customers, um, you know, it's, it's during the onboarding flow, but not necessarily, you know, right it's not necessarily uh after like an account has been fully registered right and so you know a common case where it's before th authorization uh, a user might be signing up they put in contact information uh, you know hopefully they've, they've kind of done some uh you know they shared some information with with the developer or the app um and then people will initiate plaid link um and and that's you know that's still kind of following uh, our recommendations right the more information you can have kind of before you initialize link the better uh, risk judgment you can make before you're ready to authorize that, right? Hopefully you've done some diligence on your end, you've collected enough information to feel like this is gonna be a good user of my application and you uh, embed link and that's that's totally fine. Um, so yeah, it is possible. We do still recommend, and again, this is kind of that balance of uh, on you know uh, growth versus like security. We understand that's a fine line, right? Um, but if you can embed it after authorization, that goes really well. Um, and the flip side of that is though, you know, the, the further kind of the earlier you embed, you know, Plaid Link, for example, um, the higher risk your integration would be, right? And so Dan has been talking a lot about uh, ecosystem, you know, it's not just, uh, it's not just the developers, everyone here, but it's also Plaid, it's also the banks. Um, and, and we're always trying to adjust and, and make sure that risk is minimized as well. And so, you know, maybe you, you for, you know, you want to ensure there's high growth of your app. Apply links kind of embedded earlier into your onboarding flow. Uh, that's fine, but you know that might affect some of the the things that happens with your you know your Plaid link account, right? You know maybe we might not enable uh, some of our products like transfers until you move it deeper into your application or you do more onboarding. Um, or another thing that might happen, right? For example, if you're kind of like a high risk integration, um, you know you you might see that more of your users are getting blocked just because we we want to make um, you know we just want to make <coughs> excuse me we just want to make uh, higher, you know, higher uh, accuracy decisions around who's getting to your Plaid link, uh, you know, yeah. part of that flow because of that. that. That last piece that you mentioned, Kyle, is super important. Um, I, I was here when we developed a lot of the rate limits and the sensible rate limits that we impose on downstream developer clients. A lot of them come from situations where potentially Plaid link was exposed very early on. We saw very high velocity of authentication attempts 
and we realize that this is probably not legitimate users. It's probably somebody malicious trying to take advantage of that application. So again, depending on where you sit, you're better able to control this. For Plaid, it's going to be a blunt tool like rate limiting our downstream clients or imposing CAPTCHA on all of their traffic. Um, but for the developer applications, you can actually solve this and bucket your users into good users and bad users. Um, I know we only have four minutes left. I saw Chris Clark, who's an old friend of mine from Capital One Days um, and is still in the fintech world, asked, does Plaid have any plans to provide verification services on top of authentication authorization, i.e. matching things such as name, SSN, et cetera? Um, I think that's a great product idea, Chris. Currently, we've been solving this primarily through partnerships. Um, so as an example, we have a partnership with a company called Oculus that does document verification. And so you can combine those two services. We also work with a number of banking as a service uh, platforms. Um, and that's folks like Lithic, uh, Modern Treasury, um, Unit, Rise. There's, there's a whole bunch of them um, that have those modules built in. Um, but it's definitely something we're thinking about. And it's something that we'll probably take back to our product team. Um, feel free to ping me uh, if you want to talk more about that particular. Uh, product. And then Josh Quintana uh, just wrote in with another question. Do you have a sense on the roadmap timeline for OAuth with the banks and servicers? Can imagine this would be far away as fin timelines can be slow. Um, so I can take this one, but feel free to jump in, Kyle, if there's any additional context. So we've started uh, to roll out OAuth with a pretty wide range of partners. Um, so both with Within the Plaid Exchange world, we have some OAuth-like uh, features. And then with direct agreements with some of the largest FIs, of which I think we've announced Chase, Wells Fargo, um, US Bank, Capital One, uh, among others, uh, we have actually started to send live traffic over their OAuth integrations. It's not a requirement for most of those institutions yet. Um, but if you're on the latest version of Link, you should have access to those integrations. And it's something that we definitely think will be an ongoing trend, uh, especially over the next like one to three years. Anything to add on there, Kyle? Uh, no, I think that was good. I was just going to add that um, you know we do uh, we definitely understand at Plaid there's there's going to be a long tail of you know, FIs or just financial platforms that that are running FIs uh, that might not have OAuth for a long time or just you know their timeline is going to be really long, and that's why. A lot of the work we do at Plaid as well, you know, where we sit in the ecosystem, we are able to add additional layers of security when possible. And that's something we're always really, uh, you know, being proactive about, whether it is adding MFA, uh, looking at like third party services, you know, if the platform uses an email for a login, cool. That's when we can like kind of look for compromised uh, signals. So we're always trying to add additional protections on top of that uh, while that kind of migration is happening. Yeah. And I think the other piece of this um, that, is related to some of the stuff we talked about is uh, some of the questionnaires we've been sending out um, that ensure that our developer customers uh, meet the requirements of our bank partners. Uh, we've tried to streamline that as much as possible, but I think part of the effort around OFDSS is going to be to have a standardized process um, that everybody can really pre-qualify uh, for. Uh, making sure that their application uh, meets certain security requirements and that you can get back to building that much faster um, because that's really like why we exist um, is to help y'all build faster and easier. And I think that's probably a good place to close out since we're at time. So thank you everybody for joining. Um, this was really fun. Uh, if you have any follow-up, uh, I'm easy to find on Twitter. I'm also dan at plaid.com. Kyle, what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you? Uh, I'm kberry at plaid.com, or if you email security at plaid.com, uh, a bunch of us at plaid, both on the risk and security teams, kind of all the teams that are excited to help everyone out with this, we'll, we'll follow up. We love to get questions. Uh, security at plaid.com. We, we, can, we can talk more about the stuff I've been talking about, give you some tips, tricks, uh, whatever we can do to help to improve security and trust. We're, we're happy to do that with everyone here. Awesome. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone.